Welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. The next generation light anti-tank weapon, or N-Law, was so effective that it caught us completely by surprise. Historically, since World War II, soldiers have preferred to travel the battlefield within the safety of an armored vehicle. But all that's changing now as tanks are becoming giant sitting ducks. How does it feel now that the tables have turned? The hunter has become the hunted. But why is this launcher an order of magnitude more effective compared to the old RPG? What makes it so unique? And what are its potential downsides that people aren't really talking about? Well, lock on to the like and subscribe button if you enjoy this video. Let's move out. The weapon was developed by Saab as a single soldier, short range, easy to fire system to counter enemy armored threats. The development of the N Law began way back in 1999 when the British and Swedish authorities signed a memorandum of understanding together. That's basically a weapons bro code. The plan was to create a shoulder fired, lightweight, portable anti tank system that could be fired from indoors and auto track the enemy target. Firing from inside confined spaces might not seem like a big deal, but most anti-tank systems in the past were unable to do this because of the deadly backblast from firing them, which could injure anyone standing up to 65 meters behind you. So the technology to fire this from indoors makes it especially useful for modern urban warfare. This makes the N-Law almost as dangerous as my N-Laws that I have to argue with every Christmas dinner. That's okay, I'll see myself. Using a predictive line of sight software to track the enemy target is completely novel to this system. It's based on a missile from an old system that they developed. At the time, you gotta remember, this type of weapon didn't exist. The closest thing was this Saab had this heavy, massive, non-portable, wire-guided RBS-56 build, which had a missile that would auto-detonate when it detected a nearby target. Saab used that weapon as a jumping-off point to run a test which was successful, and it got them to go ahead from the UK to continue work in 2002. They weren't able to make the warhead tandem because that would be too big, too massive to carry around. Tandem means that the missile would explode twice and defeat explosive reactive armor. Instead, they went with an improved warhead that incorporates a dynamically compensated shaped and copper line charge that would explode just once and still guarantee a one hit kill and be small enough to be man portable. Most of the design work was carried out in Sweden and the manufacturing was done in Britain. It took almost 10 years of trial and error before the n -Law went into full production. The n -Law is a third generation anti tank weapon system. My understanding is that the way the generations work is that the first generation are your World War II era anti-tank systems. So think about your tube launchers that just fire and then you run away. The second generation is wire guided and the third generation systems rely on laser or IR seekers attached to the nose of the missile. So Rafael Hidalgo Alveri wrote an excellent paper about the production history of the n -Law, where he interviewed several employees from Saab, and he got one example of how their teams function internally. So they share information across departments in the anti-tank weapon system teams, so that they're able to take bits and pieces that they learned from past weapons, like the Carl Gustav, and apply it to the end law. He gave an example of one 72-year-old employee that was working at Saab, who was responsible for inventing the missile guidance principle because he was inspired by other systems at Saab. He's known as a guru within the company who has a solid reputation. He's able to back any weapon system by just saying it's simply good to go. A 2008 audit paper from the Minister of Defense talked about how the teams failed an internal 2006 design qualification test in November 2006. They needed to reduce how long it took to train on the system. And according to their own analysis, there was no armored threat in NATO at the time. So delaying a few years wouldn't disrupt current operations. So why wasn't Russia working on a similar system at the same time? I think the reason Russia and China don't have any advanced third generation weapons technology like this that's on par with the Javelin or the N-Law is because it took cooperation from countries across the entire globe to make something as revolutionary as the N-Law. For instance, the missile's inertia system, the measurement unit, is manufactured by BAE Systems at Plymouth, Massachusetts. They then created a whole entire new semiconductor facility for mass production in Japan. Japan created the silicon rate sensors that are in the missile. 14 different subcontractors in the UK were required for the manufacturing of the weapon. It took resources and specialized skills and engineering that cannot be found in one or two countries. Nothing brings countries together like the shared vision for an awesome defensive weapon like the N-Law. The final assembly was
was completed at Thales Air Defense in the UK. Once the system got approval in 2008, they created well over 20,000 units of the NLAW so far, and each one has about a unit cost of around $40,000, which yeah, it might sound expensive, but it's far cheaper than the cost of a tank, and it's way cheaper than the $200,000 Javelin system. This costs $40,000, but there's still styrofoam pieces all over it. That's where the British military and Saab decided to skimp out. It's like getting one of those McMansion houses made out of cardboard. Now, of course, the real reason they made it out of styrofoam is probably to keep the weight down. The whole concept of the end law is a lot like the David versus Goliath story, where the end law allows a regular, lowly, average soldier with less than an hour of training to take out a $2 million enemy tank. Ukrainian Army Staff Sergeant Roman Yeremenko, 28 years old, predicted how useful the weapon would be a full two weeks prior to the Russian Army's invasion of his country when he said, quote, Technically, they are brilliant missiles. As before, we only had RPGs. These weapons are absolutely a game changer for us. It's as if they have a brain. You can fire and forget them from buildings and trenches, and you can also target hidden tanks. Wow, so we actually made a next generation weapon that works? So what are the actual specifications for the N-Law weapon? And what sets it apart from other AT systems? The N-Law weighs 28 pounds and is just over three feet long. It comes preloaded inside the tube, so there's no need for setting it up or assembling it like IKEA furniture. No, it comes ready to rock. That's kind of one downside to the weapon though, because once you fire it, you have to ditch it. Unlike other anti-tank systems like the RPG, which are much lighter weight and can be reloaded, so it's a trade-off. The actual projectile's diameter for the N-Law, pretty massive at 150 mil, for reference, that's about the size of an artillery shell. This is why the missile undoubtedly destroys armor. With the RPG, you have to cross your fingers that it's going to penetrate the tank. Saab has boasted that their munition can penetrate any modern tank armor, even ones fitted with the Russian reactive armor. Another key piece as to why this system is special is that it comes with a 2.5 magnified optical sight with night vision. This night vision is better than what most enemy tanks have, so it gives troops a huge advantage. The max effective range for engaging targets targets is 800 meters, however that drops to 400 meters when you're aiming at moving target. This means you have to be up close with the N-Law compared to the Javelin, which can be a drawback. The Javelin thermal guided system for reference can do 2000 meters range. Commander, they're firing in-laws at us. No, not my in-laws, what are they doing here? <sighs> We already did this joke, it wasn't funny the first time. Enlaw's actual missile warhead is high explosive anti-tank ammunition and has a special ability compared to other similar rounds that the RPG fires. It is proximity trigger, which means that it will sense when it's over the enemy target about a meter above and automatically explode at that point. This takes a lot of human error out of the marksmanship equation. So with the RPG, you're constantly missing. With this, that doesn't really happen. They say it's idiot proof, but I'll be the judge of that. Saab developed the system software, which has what's called a fine-tuned predictive line of sight tool. This is the heart of what makes the N-Law unique from old anti-tank second generation weapons. The guidance system works by having the computer targeting system predict the enemy's location instead of locking on using a thermal signature like the Javelin does. The way it works is the gunner views the enemy tank for three seconds, then the guidance package records the movements and calculates both the distance to the target and the target speed. If it's moving, then the missile guides itself, actually moves as it's on the way to the target, thanks to the computer predicted location. The NLAW missile makes any and all corrections according to the data that was acquired during the initial tracking phase from the gunner. Once the missile's left the tube, the gunner doesn't have to continue tracking the target. They can just fire and forget. The munition flies at about 400 miles per hour and can penetrate up to 20 inches of enemy armor, which is overkill for most modern tanks. When it comes to moving targets, the missile guidance system extrapolates the movement of the target, predicts the position of them, and then it corrects the flight path and route to the target. So the sensor on the missile is actually analyzing the target once it goes overhead and instantaneously it's matching the known target against this target that it sees so that the warhead will only detonate if it's over a tank. The missile successfully activates if the target is partially concealed, like when the Russians are trying to fool the Enlaw with all those cope cages that they ghetto rigged on top of their tanks in Ukraine. So you might be wondering how the Enlaw can determine when to explode. It uses magnetic and optical sensors on the munition to detect the instant that it's over the enemy target. This is useful for its overfly top attack mode when it flies one meter above the line of sight and triggers its explosion on top of the armor, which is used 
usually the tank's weakest point. You don't need to be able to see the entire tank, only a small portion of the target needs to be visible. So technically this could work against targets that are dug in and hidden behind dirt berms and defensive structures. The T-72 is especially vulnerable to these kind of attacks against the turret. Have you ever noticed when you see a, a Russian tank knocked out, the turret is usually blown off? This is because the T-72 and earlier Russian tanks, they store their ammo magazine and their extra tank shells inside the turret due to the autoloader that Russian tanks use. It means that the crew doesn't have to manually load their ammo, but the trade-off is that the ammo isn't confined in safe racks. So it's not behind blast doors when it explodes. It's usually a catastrophic event for the entire crew. The American M1 Abrams, on the other hand, has the ammo stored in an armored magazine behind an armored door, which prevents the ammo from blowing up when there's a fire inside the turret. The end law gunner has to choose whether to use top attack or direct attack mode by pressing a button. In direct attack, the missile fuse system is disconnected and the warhead simply detonates when it impacts with the target after a short delay. So it can be used against helicopters or buildings in this direct attack mode. So why did this weapon's success surprise us so much? It seemed like it came out of nowhere, but there was early evidence of how effective it was going to be. I found an old live fire test report published by Saab in April of 2014 where they reported that the Enlaw brand new gunners were engaging targets in bad weather conditions and they were still hitting the test targets well beyond the recommended distance. Johan Ekrud, product manager for the Enlaw, said, quote, these firing tests highlight performance beyond the Enlaw was originally specified for and the results really do show the system's outstanding capability. Keep in mind, April of 2014 when this happened is only about two months months after Russia had annexed Crimea. So it's possible that this weapon wasn't really factored into their plans when they invaded Ukraine in 2022. They didn't account for how much the end law would be able to make a huge difference against their armor. So for instance, to date, NATO has supplied 10,000 of these to Ukraine by March 9th, 2022. Even if only 3% of those hit their target, that's 300 destroyed Russian tanks. Some weapons have to wait a while before they're battle tested, but in the grand scheme of things, the end law was barely off the assembly line before being put to test. It barely built a reputation for the armies that it was made for. I think British generals are breathing a huge sigh of relief now over the fact that they spent millions of dollars on a new weapon that actually works. Not always the case for military higher up. The internet is littered with videos and pictures of wrecked Russian tanks and other armored vehicles crediting the end law. I don't think humanity has seen such a new product get so much praise since forever. When interviewed, Lieutenant Colonel Bavetsky of Ukraine said, God save the queen, the end law is a game changer. Thank you to Great Britain for giving us the end law. Anything that helps us defend our country is very well received. These missiles have changed the war for us. It means we can fight the Russians and it doesn't matter how many of them there are now that we have a way of stopping their armor. The Russians cannot scare us with numbers anymore. There is evidence that these kind of weapons have fallen into the hands of the Russian military. We're yet to see if they're able to actually duplicate the weapon systems in any meaningful way. They might be too expensive and complicated for the Russian military industrial complex to reverse engineer and handle. The Russian army doesn't really have any third generation AT weapons currently. And if they're able to successfully reverse engineer the Enlaw and the Javelin, that would be bad news for NATO armor. So the Enlaw was kind of a weapon that the British wanted as a secondary anti-tank weapon to the Javelin, but it turns out really kicks ass. There are some disadvantages, mainly it doesn't have the type of range as a typical AT missile, and it's quite expensive. We will see how this weapon will affect the outcome of future wars. Maybe it'll make tanks obsolete. Let us know what you think in the comments. Did I miss anything about the end law? I'm Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching Task and Purpose. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to learn more about anti-tank weapon systems, click this playlist here.